What a blessing. Amen. What a blessing to be here. That last hymn that the lady sang, uh, one of the hymns would be in the hymn book that my pastor is producing. Uh, that's the first time, other than our church, I've ever heard that song sung in any church in 38 years. And it's going to be in that hymn book along with 1,199 of them. <laughs> and most of them are obscure. Uh, many of them are the old Baptist hymns that have been squelched over the years, burned, or, uh, you know, have been uh, just left out of hymn books, deleted out of hymn books. And uh, what I like about that song is that first line, that Christ returned from the wars. Mm -hmm. Folks, he's still on the throne. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know things look kind of bleak in our nation. That's what I'm going to be preaching about tonight. I've been struggling all day about uh, what to preach, and I think God gave me the gave me the okay to preach this. But the Lord, when He went back to heaven, He sat down on the right hand of the Father, victorious. He wasn't defeated at the cross of Calvary. He was victorious. The Bible plainly says if the princes of this world would have known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Satan thought he was getting rid of Jesus Christ. Satan, Satan's not omniscient like God Almighty is. He doesn't know everything. Yeah. Amen. He forgot about the resurrection. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And through the resurrection we have victory in Christ Jesus. I know things look kind of bleak, but listen. Listen. When he comes back in the rapture, he's coming back victorious. Amen. Amen. And he's taking us out of here victorious. Right. Amen. We're not going to be the losers. We're not the losers now. You saved by the grace of God. I mean, folks, listen. You got you you got it made in the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. through Him, not through ourselves, but through Him. Not only that, folks. Seven years later, when he comes back in the second advent, and I almost preached on that tonight, but. Uh, he came back to the second advent. He's coming back victorious. That's right. Amen. So he's got it all under control. No problem whatsoever. I mean, you know, if things look dark, things look bleak, just lift up your head. Your redemption draws nigh. Now, I know that's a tribulation passage, but it applies now, too. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And like I say, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't get any surprises of the things that happened. Uh, that's the way our nation is gone. When Samuel was the last prophet over the nation of Israel, they said, we're, we're tired of this theocracy. We're tired of being prophet ruled by God and we want a king like the other nations that will go out before us in battle and come back in again. And Samuel showed them what manner of king they would have. First Samuel chapter 8, you'll read that in your Bible sometime, you'll become aware of the fact that what Samuel told them is exactly what the Antichrist is going to do to Israel in the tribulation. But yet they said, after all that warning, they said, we still want a king. We want to be like the other nations. Well, God had told them they wouldn't be like the other nations. God said they wouldn't be numbered among the nations in Numbers 23, verse 9. But they said, no, we want to be like the other nations, have us a king. So they got one. They got Saul. And he was a type of the Antichrist. Amen. So listen. He was the people's choice. The people have made their choice. So we've got to deal with it. We've got to live with it. We've got to realize that the only thing that's worth living for is Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I hope you're saved tonight. Because if you're not, you don't want to be around what's going to take place the next four years. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I don't want to be around anyway, <laughs> but, but I know that whatever happens, I'm saved by the grace of God, not my own, not my own merit, but through Him. Amen. 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 Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. I think I mentioned this verse earlier in the week, but we'll be one, two verses in Proverbs and, and two verses in Isaiah 59. So, being Proverbs chapter 22. Of course, we know this is talking about the nation of Israel, but it has an application to our, to our church age that we're living in now. And that's what we're going to bring tonight. 
Proverbs chapter 22, verse 28, the Bible says, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. You see that? All right, notice down in verse 10 of chapter 20, of 23, chapter 23, Remove not the old landmark. Isn't it amazing how the Bible defines itself? You don't have to go to a Hebrew dictionary to see what ancient means. It means old. Remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless. So God set up some rules for the nation of Israel. Of course, they didn't follow them. And our country's not following them either. But you and I as Bible believers, we have, a, we have an obligation to follow what God said. Look at Isaiah 59. And you'll see what's happened to our nation. And it, it, it breaks my heart. But in Isaiah chapter 59, the Bible says in verse number 14, And judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. Amen. Let's pray. Father, give us wisdom now as we look to your word. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll speak to our hearts tonight. We're thankful and grateful, Lord, for all that you've done and all you're going to do. And we're glad, Father, you've got everything under control. You put kings on the throne. You take them off the throne. And, Father, we know that nothing happens without your ordaining it to be so and without you knowing. So we pray, Lord Jesus, that your blessed will be done in everything. Help me as I try to preach tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. The word remove means a departure, a going away. Uh, look over in 1 Timothy chapter 4. In 1 Timothy chapter 4. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Folks, we're there. Amen. We're there. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Amen. All right, look over in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Beginning with verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. Remember the hymn, the song of the sweet by and by? I guess that's what the, what's where that came from. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering unto together unto Him. Folks, that's going to happen. That's the reality. That's the next thing on God's calendar of events for God to step up, Jesus Christ to step out on the cloud and say, come up hither. Amen. And when He says, come up hither, we're out of here. Amen. 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 That'd be great if it happened tonight. I've always believed that the rapture would take place in the springtime, but the Lord could mess me up and Amen. come in this Come in November, that suit me just fine. Amen. Amen. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he is God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, folks, there's a high possibility that you and I sitting here tonight will be the last generation of Christians on this earth before Jesus Christ comes. I don't know that for certain. I don't know anything for certain except the fact this Bible is the Word of God and that I'm saved by the grace of God and I'm married to Ron. I know those three things. Amen. <laughs> 37 years now. But listen, if this is so, you and I sitting here tonight, as insignificant as you and I might be to this world, and we are, we have a responsibility to God to finish this thing right. 
Yes. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. We have a responsibility as a church age saints in the last, last, latter or last days to finish what God started 2,000 years ago. Amen. The church started in persecution. It may end that way. I don't know. Our heritage, and we'll learn about that in a little while, is of persecution. And uh, the Bible's plain and clear on that. Now look, there's some several things because this has been entrusted to us. These treasures have been given to us. And we are treasures in earthen vessels, the Bible says. You say, I don't look much like a treasure. Well, I don't either. But that's what the Lord said. His Spirit dwells in you and I that are saved by the grace of God. So we are treasures on this earth of God, for God, to God. And this world doesn't understand us. There's some things that God doesn't want us to remove. And first of all, I want you to see one of those things is our heavenly, our heavenly burdened heart. Heavy, as in heavy. Our heavenly burdened heart. God doesn't want us to remove that. Look over in Ezekiel for an example. Let me show you something of the Old Testament. You know, if you will follow, if you will follow the nation of Israel and what happened to them in the Old Testament, you'll find the United States followed along with that same pattern. As a matter of fact, you look at the word Jerusalem and you've got USA right in the middle of it. Isn't that amazing? I'm sure that's just a coincidence, but listen, folks, uh, uh, we're following the same pattern that Israel followed, and there is no doubt in my mind that Israel and the United States of America are the two greatest nations in the history of the world. Yeah, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Israel's responsibility was to get the gospel out of the world. They failed. Our responsibility now is to get the gospel out of the world. And we're trying to get that done, but we have fallen far, far short of that task. But thank God for those that are doing it. Amen. Amen. Now listen. Look at Ezekiel chapter 9. Now this is an example of what happened to the nation of Israel. He cried also in my ears, with a loud voice saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man of slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was unto the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with the linen which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Folks, I don't hate my nation tonight. No, no, no. I pity them. I do. I sigh and I cry for America and how she's fallen from the glory that we once had. Yeah. And I contend that you get away from this Bible, you get away from the Lord Jesus Christ, that's going to happen to any nation. Amen. It's what happened to Israel and that's what's happening to us. That's right. Still the greatest country in the world. Amen. Still is. Right. You say, why? Well, we have freedom to worship the Lord. Amen. We do. You can't do that in every country in this world. But listen, our, our burdened hearts, we should not, we, folks, it's not fun having a burden, is it? It's not fun being burdened for your, your loved ones and your neighbors and your friends and your church and your neighbors, but God commanded us to do that. You say, where? Look at Galatians. Galatians. You say, well, Brother Mitch, I don't particularly like that Old Testament reference. That's what not well. Galatians 6 is. Look at Galatians chapter 6 and notice this. <clears throat> and I've heard people say something about this passage, that there's a contradiction here. We'll see about that in just a second. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now notice it says overtaken in a fault. When a man becomes overtaken in a fault, it becomes a sin. A fault is not a sin. James 5.16 says confess your faults, not your sins. 
That is, if you got the right Bible. Amen. Amen. I don't confess my sins to any man except the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'll, now, now, folks, you, the, a fault is something that is a shortcoming that can come to sin if it's not checked. Out in California, there's a fault line called the San Andreas Fault. It's not an earthquake. It's the potential to become an earthquake. But it's not one. It's a fault. And that's the way faults are. They can become sins if they're not dealt with in our life. Amen. That's why the Bible says confess your faults. I don't confess my sins to someone that's got more sin in his life than I've got. That's for sure. Only one sinless individual ever lived on the face of this earth. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. How about that? Amen. Now look at this. The Bible said, Restore such one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. You say, now wait a minute, Brother Mitch, that says up, up here in the first verse, or the second verse, bear ye one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. Now here it says, every man must shall bear his own burden. That sounds like a contradiction to me. No, it's not. We've got double duty. Yeah. We bear our own burden, but we bear everybody else's as well. And that's not easy. That's not a contradiction. That's double duty. Double duty. And folks, that's where we stand tonight. My, my responsibility as a child of God, not only to bear my burden, but to be burdened about your problems too. That's the love that God puts in our hearts when He saves us. And I'm afraid many, many times I don't have the burden for others that I should have. I've got preacher friends right now, right now, that are, are, that are dealing with sicknesses. And uh, good men, I mean great men, great preachers, dealing with sickness, dealing with uh, cancer. Some of them's had surgery. And they're facing some recovery time. And uh, I'm burdened about them. I'm burdened about them because I've been there. I've had cancer myself. So I know what they're going through. I know what they're going through. So I can help bear their burden. I mean, I may not to be able to lift that load like I would like to, but I can go to the Lord and say, Lord, help them. Please help them. The only way I got through with what I went through is the grace of God, the help of the Lord, God's people praying, and people being concerned about me. And folks, folks, listen, listen tonight. We're, we're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're to love one another, support one another as best we can. Amen. I was talking to the brother here before the service tonight, and he's talking about the, your infirmities, and he's talking about the, the, feeling, the feeling bad and hurting, and, and we all do that at times. <laughs> but when you go visit a nursing home and see those folks there, and some of them never, never they're, they're laying in a bed, and they don't even know they're in the world. Or you go to the hospital, a good friend of mine's middle daughter was just shot through the neck. And she laid, she's recovering now. They said she never would. The doctor said she never would, but she's recovering. She's still partially paralyzed, but, but it went right through her carotid artery and out the back of her neck and it hit her spine. And, and uh, this girl uh, I've known for many, many years, and this, this, this guy is one of my best friends. In the wrong place at the wrong time. And I thought about the problems that she's going to have in rehabilitation and getting back to where if she ever does regain use of her body. You know, people got troubles, folks. And we're to be burdened about it. And that's unpleasant, isn't it, sometimes? But we've got to do it. God said, why? Because he said, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so fulfill the law of Christ. He bore, he bore our burdens. Folks, every one of us sitting here tonight had a burden of sin upon yourself that you could not alleviate yourself. You could not remedy it. You could not get rid of it. Only the Lord Jesus Christ. Only the Lord Jesus Christ. I try to think about that every day. Look over in Romans, the book of Romans, chapter 9. The Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian in the New Testament, 
He certainly carried a burden. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9 verse 1. The Bible said, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I can wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Verse 4, he said, who are Israelites? Did you pray that prayer? That God would curse you in order that your brethren would be saved? I don't know. I don't think I've reached that level yet. But Paul did under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He said in Romans 10, verse 1, we can quote it, but let's read it so you can see. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Folks, you got a whole nation of people tonight trying to be right with God, trying to do religious things to be pleasing to God, and they have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Folks, do not remove this burdened heart. As heavy as it gets sometimes, God commands us to keep it. Amen? As a last day scenario, and I believe that's where we're at right now. Amen. Number two, remove not our heavenly, heavenly given Bible. Our heavenly give, given Bible. Look over in the second Timothy. You have folks here in your church that are doing your part in that area too, and thank God for that. It won't make you popular, but it will make you right. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Familiar passage of Scripture. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished, unto all good works. This nation is trying its dead level best to get rid of King James Bible. It's been going on now for 150 years strong and it's getting stronger every day. There's been about 235 English translations produced since 1880 trying to get the King James Bible off the throne. God says, don't do it. Don't do it. Look at what he says here. Now we can quote this too, but let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. The Bible said in verse 14. 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? Look at it. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as a sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Let it never be said about Country Chapel Baptist Church, about Bruce Ireland, the pastor, that he ever tried to correct one word of this book. Amen. Amen. They'll drive by here and they'll think you're all crazy, but they'll know one thing. You know what you believe and you stand for it and you're not going to back down. Amen. 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 Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, another passage of Scripture from very familiar. Paul said, We are not as many. Do you know they were trying to corrupt the Word of God in Paul's day? Right when it was written, they were trying to corrupt it. The only reason we've got a Bible today is through the grace of God. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. The Bible says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, 
Because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as is in truth the word of God which ye faithfully worketh also in you that believe. Now folks, listen to me. I'm not God tonight, and I'm not the Apostle Paul. And what I'm preaching tonight to you is not an inspired sermon in the sense that our Bible is inspired, but what I'm reading unto you is the Scripture, the Word of God, and we've got to take heed to it. That's a fact. It's not my opinion. It's not my ideas. Folks, my opinion is not worth a hill of beans if it doesn't go by the Bible. And Amen. neither is yours. Amen. The Apostle Paul said in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Acts 27, he said, I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. And that's exactly what I'm telling you tonight. Folks, listen. Everything is going to happen just as this Bible said, every dispensation in the Bible has ended in apostasy. Yes, sir. And so is this one. Yes, sir. That doesn't mean I have to like it. <laughs> that doesn't mean I want it to, but that's, I mean it's clear in the scripture. Even, look, folks, listen, even the millennial reign is going to end in apostasy. You say, why? Because when man's involved, apostasy is involved. Falling away, a falling away falling away. That doesn't make me happy either. <laughs> Number three, folks, remove not our hard-fought heritage. Look over to Colossians. Colossians. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 17. The Bible says, And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. See that? The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. Folks, it's a hard fault heritage that we have here tonight as Bible believers. Amen. As Bible believing Baptists, which we are here tonight, we have a Hard fault heritage. First of all, folks, I want you to look at Acts 15 where it came from. Look at Acts chapter 15. And notice with me tonight that it's a hazarded heritage. Acts chapter 15, verse 22. The Bible says, Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren sent greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from you, uh, excuse me, from us have troubled you with words subverting your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. Folks, our heritage we have tonight is a hazarded heritage. It's a, it is a heritage that was bought with the suffering and the blood of of the martyrs Amen. and our ancestors, our forerunners. Just don't let it go. Yes. Let's just don't toss it aside and say, well, it don't fit into this new age we're in. Hmm. Jesus Christ didn't fit into the new age either. Jesus Christ didn't fit into to Rome's age back in the day in which he lived. Amen. But guess who was right and who was wrong? Look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Folks, uh, I, I don't want to be a prophet of doom tonight. Listen, I'm heavy hearted just like you are tonight. I really am. But folks, I know that there's victory in Christ Jesus. Amen. And that's Amen. the only place this victory. Folks, listen, if you look to the economy or your job or your money or your health or your insurance, you're going to fail because it, it's, all going to, it's, all going to, it's all going to just vanish away one of these days. But Jesus Christ is not. Amen. That's what we can tell a lost sinner. We can tell them there is hope through Christ Jesus. Amen. Look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15, 
Verse number 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Oh, in Jeremiah 23, 18, Jeremiah said, they mark my words. They mark your words, and that's what they'll do. They'll mark what you say. They'll keep your saying, like Christ said, so that they can try to find contradiction in your testimony. They did it to Jesus Christ, and He was sinlessly perfect. We're not. How about that? It's a hated heritage. Not only is our heritage hazarded, but it's hated. Look at John 16, right down just the 16th chapter, verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended, that they shall put you out, they shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Why would they do such a thing? Why? Why would somebody kill somebody and think they're serving God by doing it? Look at this. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. I know, folks, in the Old Testament, Israel was commanded to do it. I know that, but we're not Israel. This is not a theocracy any longer. This is not replacement theology. We don't have the right to do what God used the nation of Israel to do to get the promised land ready for them to come in there. Listen, I have no right to persecute or kill anybody for the cause of Christ. Amen. Amen. Or any other God. You say, prove that, brother bitch. Okay. Lastly, look at Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Remove not our heavenly burdened hearts. Remove not our heavenly given, our heavenly given Bible. Remove not our hard fought heritage. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. What shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David also and of Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned flight the army of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, more of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Folks, listen, I don't think anybody sitting in here has gone through what these people have gone through. But they went through this to give us the heritage that we've got. Now listen to me. I mentioned a few nights ago about some of our Baptist ancestors, James Ireland and John Weatherford. James, and folks, this is in Virginia, the state of Virginia. And I don't know how many of you were here when I dealt with this back, about, back in 2008, but I don't even know if I even mentioned them back in those days. But James Ireland was from uh, Virginia and Culpeper and uh, John Weatherford from Chesterfield County. Those men were in prison time and time and time again for preaching the gospel, just like your pastor. James Ireland, they tried to, folks, listen to me, he was just a Baptist preacher, a separate Baptist preacher, just like we are. But in this country in those days, we didn't have religious liberty. We didn't have religious freedom. Rhode Island was the first state in the United States to have complete religious liberty. James Ireland 
was so hated by the congregationalists and by the establishment that they persecuted him unmercifully. They put him in jail. They did everything to try to shut his mouth from preaching the gospel. So they put him in jail one time and they, 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 they put uh, wood under the jail to smoke, try to smoke him and try to kill him. That didn't happen. They burned sulfur to try to kill him. That didn't, he didn't die. So they came upon the idea of taking the roughest, toughest rowdy in the whole community and putting him in there with James Ireland. They said, we'll, we'll get him, we'll get him, we'll kill him. Because he'll try to preach to this guy and make him mad. And then the guy will kill him. He was huge and mean. Well, you know what happens when you put a lost sinner in a jail cell with a soul winner? <laughs> <laughs> James Ireland, back in those days, we're talking about the 1600s, 1700s. Back in those days, you didn't, when you went to prison, you didn't have uh, the state provide what you, what you ate or what you wore. Uh, your family had to do it. So they'd bring food and clothes to James Ireland, and you know what he would do, don't you? He would give it to the man in the jail cell with him. Provide him with food, because he didn't have any family that cared anything about him. And that broke that man's heart. And he saw a man of God, and he led that rowdy to Jesus Christ. After that, nobody messed with Pastor Ireland. <laughs> he had his own personal built-in bodyguard. <laughs> Amen? How about that? That's a true story, folks. He led that man to Jesus Christ in the jail cell. John Weatherford, great Baptist preacher in Chesterfield County, Virginia. He would preach, he would preach to his people they tried to shut him up. They finally put him in prison. I've been to the place where the jail cell still sits. It's, a, it's a, the, right on the grounds where it said John Weather, they put him in jail. His congregation. Now think about this, folks, here at Country Chapel Baptist Church. Think to yourself, would you do this? They put John Weatherford in jail, and his congregation would gather outside the jail bars, and he would preach to them, and he would thrust his hands out through the bars, to, to make a point like I do sometime and when they did the magistrates would just whack his arms and hands with their knives till blood just flew and he'd bring his arms back in and he'd get to preach and he couldn't help it again he'd make a point when he did the blood would just fly out of his arms and it would just fly all over his congregation he'd sprinkle his congregation with his own blood while he was preaching still couldn't stop him still couldn't stop him so they built a wall outside his jail cell where he, where he couldn't see his people. So, and they put, they put glass on the top of it and uh, bones and things on top where the people couldn't get it, climb up the wall. So the folks would go out there and just raise a flag on a pole to let, them, let him know inside the jail that they were there and he would stand in the jail and preach to them through the wall. Amen. 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 When John Weatherford died, they, had, they said those that were there and said he was in his tomb, they had his arms laid across his chest and said you could still see the white scars on his hands and on his arms where he suffered for the cause of Christ. Like Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Folks, we had not, we've not yet resisted under blood striving against sin. We might, but we haven't yet. But yet we get discouraged sometimes awful easy, don't we? Mm -hmm. Amen. Awful easy. What if you had to come to hear your pastor preach from a jail cell? Folks, we have got a horrifying heritage. It's a heritage bought with blood. That's just two examples. My pastor could stand here and give you 50 right off the top of his head. A Baptist that were put in jail in this country for preaching the gospel in all of the 13 colonies. Absolutely. Folks, we have a horrifying heritage. In conclusion tonight, folks, in the light of what we've seen in the scripture, what we've learned from history, do we really want to be the generation that, that lets all this fall by the wayside? I know we're in apostasy. I know that. I know we're the Laodicean church age. I know that. But we don't have to be in it. We can be the Philadelphian church period in 
the Laodicean church period. In essence, that's what you folks are because you've kept the word of God. You're Philadelphian Christians right smack in the middle of the Laodicean church age. Amen. What does Laodicea mean? Rights of the people. God don't have any rights in this age. People's got all the rights. Yeah. Amen. Amen. What is the church at Philadelphia? The church of brotherly love. The only one of the churches, the seven churches that kept the word of God. Laodicea is the only one of the seven churches that talked back to God when God rebuked them. Yeah. You want to say, why? We have our rights. God's not going to tell us what to do. We will not have this man to rule over us, they said about Jesus Christ. And that's what the world says today. Do you love him tonight, folks? Yeah. Now, folks, you, you, you may not be able to get out here and, 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 and preach on the street. You may not be able to get out here and wave a banner. I'm a Christian. But you can just take that subtle stand where you need to take it. You can follow your pastor as he tries to take a stand. I don't know what the next few days and weeks and months and years is going to bring. But I hope it brings the rapture of the church. I don't know, but I know this. I don't want to be a part of any generation that lets these things go and removes these things from the church. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your infinite grace and mercy. I know, Father, tonight, and you know, we're troubled here tonight about the shape and condition of our nation, and we should be. Tonight, Country Chapel Baptist Church is a great minority, just like all Bible-believing churches are. But Lord, I know this. I know your spirit dwells here because the Bible's here. And the folks that are saved are here. And we feel like we can't do much, Lord, but we can do a whole lot more than what we think. Please, Father, give us grace. Give us grace not to remove these things, not to fumble the ball, so to speak, <coughs> that is handed down to us by our ancestors. Then we can at least do this. We can at least be faithful when you call us home. We don't be now be setting the woods on fire the way some churches think they're doing. But Lord, we can at least be faithful to the things of God, the Word of God. And we'll thank you for what you do. Let us never even think about correcting one word of this blessed book. Let us stand before the judgment, if anything, believing it too much, as the world says, rather than not enough. And we'll thank you for what you do. Touch our bodies. Give us strength. God, we're tired. We're weary, Lord. We're hurting. We've got family and friends that are in pain and suffering. Help us, Heavenly Father, to be what we should be. To be a part of that balm of Gilead that helps to bring healing to a sin-sick soul and a troubled heart. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.